takes the shot, and it is just wide. Left foot shot, goal, York United. Lovely set up for Mason. They are running rough shot on the provincial rivals. Lamont swatted by Sirwas. There's a strike from outside, and there's the header. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the newsroom on the 9th May of 2022. May 2022, Christian Jack alongside Charlie O'Connor Clark. As usual, as you all have just seen, if you're watching live, we had another fantastic weekend of action in the Canadian Premier League. And for the next hour, we will break down all the matches for you and get you set, of course, for five Canadian Championship matches this week with three on Tuesday and two more on Wednesday. That's right, the magic of the cup. The cup sets will be in the headlines as well this week as we get you set for five great games. We've got a special guest later as well joining you in the show. Uh, before we get to that, though, we will recap week five in the Canadian Premier League. You saw some of the goals there. Uh, if you missed some of them, the results, York United won Forge FC nil, a goal from Sebastian Gutierrez as, he's dan as he danced around the box and all the defenders to secure the only goal of the game and all three points for Martin Nash's side. Uh, the doubleheader on Friday ended in Alberta with FC Edmonton nil, Cavalry three, uh, Musi and Mason again amongst the goals. Uh, Valor nil, Halifax nil on Saturday, and Atletico Ottawa nil, Pacific FC won a goal from Alejandro Diaz. His league leading fourth of the season was enough to secure all three points taken back to the island. Uh, Charlie, great to see you again. Uh, a fantastic weekend. Yeah. And a good looking ahead as well. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, it, it, it doesn't stop. The, the great games keep flowing. I mean, you know, we did have a nil nil this weekend, but. Other than that, across the board, some very competitive matches, some entertaining ones, and as seems like is always the case in the CPL, at least two or three absolute highlight reel goals. Like the, the end of season highlight reel is just going to be like an hour long at this point, yes. I think. Talking talking of an hour, after the hour show today, we will show you again, if you've missed it, the goals of April. Uh, stick around for that at the end of this uh, the show as well, because that's pretty special. But as Charlie alluded to, uh, we are only in five weeks and we've had some magical, magical goals. Yeah. Uh, and this week we start because we know that last week some York United fans weren't very happy <laughs> with us being last on the show again. Uh, this week we start with York and we'll bring in our own Mitchell Tierney, who was with us at York Lions Stadium on Friday. Uh, Mitchell, great to see you, my man. This was a special day. Uh, for York fans, I know they'd started the season well, but you know when they play Forge, it's always even more special, the rivalry there amongst the fan base. I know there was a certain hockey team playing on Friday night, but the <laughs> crowd was still decent and the rivalry was existing. Uh, Charlie's shaking his head. We won't mention what happened last night. Uh, but Mitchell, this was a special game. And, uh, and again, a, I think a deserved three points for York United. What, what did you think? Yeah, I think it's it's only right that we start with York because they were one of the stories of the weekend. I mean, it was uh, it was a strong performance from them from maybe not start uh, to finish because obviously I think we'll get into the the goal that uh, maybe should have been for for Forge right off the top, but um, you know after that I think they picked up very well and and against a, a very good Forge attack. I mean, they limited them to zero point three six expected goals, which is incredible um, to to do against Forge. Yeah, it, it, it does seem like quite a comprehensive uh, York, especially defensive performance. And part of the, the reason for that, part of the reason that they've defended so well all year has been kind of, you know, that back four plus the two midfielders in front of them. But in this game, instead of the, the Jordan Wilson, Noah Verhoeven pairing, it's, uh, it's Isaiah Johnson dropping back after mm -hmm. playing as a 10 in some of those other games. Um, you know, Mitchell, I don't, I don't know, you were, you were obviously the closest eyes on this game from our team. So just what did you see from kind of that slightly different look at the back for York and how they were able to, to sort of keep forged to the perimeters into the lower quality shots? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Johnson because that was a player that Jordan Wilson mentioned after the game as well of, of doing a fantastic job and said that, you know, he wasn't always pleased during the match. You heard uh, you heard a lot of barking from him and uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of frustration with, with the way things went. But um, I thought he was tremendous in the middle of the park, very tidy. 
And uh, there was one block late in the game where against David Chouanier where he gets out to the, the top of the box. You can just see all of his teammates, like how much that means to them that a young player is switched on like that to, to make an incredible block. And, you know, obviously it helps when you've got guys like Wilson and, and Zator behind you to, to um, yeah, pick things up like, like that and be leaders back there. I thought Wilson and Zator were tremendous. Both could have made the team of the week. Only one did. Uh, Zator actually get in and we'll announce that later. Uh, but Jordan Wilson played a pass with his left foot into midfield that actually led to the Gutierrez goal. Uh, I know it was about 10 or 15 seconds earlier than that, but that shouldn't be lost either. Um, we're going to hear from him and Martin Nash shortly, but before we do that, we have to start our, our analysis quickly on the goal. Uh, Sebastian Gutierrez, we just saw the highlights there for, you, for those of you watching online. Um, Mitchell, you could see him and what it meant to him. There was a big party going on there in the corner with the York fans who all, all went there with the flares went off and Gutierrez's shirts going around his neck. As if, I mean, it looked like they'd won a championship, but it, 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 it did be forged. That's what it means yeah. to them. Um, mm. you know, but the hips don't lie, so to speak, as Gutierrez danced his way through there and there's a delightful finish. Yeah, it certainly was. And, you know, it, it, if there was going to be a player to score in this game, I think it was going to be Sebastian Gutierrez. He had a couple of chances earlier, one that, you know, flashed just left of the of the post. Um, and yeah, it was it was a solid performance from him, I thought. And, and in those moments, you know, against a team like Forge, you have to do something special to to score a goal. And he, he certainly did that. Uh, the, the patience. I mean, uh, I think it was Martin Nash was, was saying that, you know, he's just yelling at him, shoot on the sidelines, but he has that, uh, he has that moment of, of dummying the, of dummying Tristan Henry and yeah, brilliant goal. Certainly the goal of the, the weekend from the Canadian Premier. Yeah, it's, it certainly was, you know, we're going to get to Forge because I think there's a lot of questions about them right now. We can we highlight first, but we have to start with York because they lose that opening game to Edmonton. Since then, they've been in every game. They haven't lost that. that. Things are very different now under Nash. You can see that these are the kind of games that they are happy to play in. And you alluded to the expected goals that they kept Forge to. Now, that doesn't include the premature whistle on the Terran Campbell shot because that doesn't count as an action. So obviously, the expected goals would go up higher than that. And Campbell was blown offside. It has to be said the whistle went before the ball went in the net. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, upon review, it wasn't offside. But I just wanted to say that that does skew the uh, the chances created a little bit. Uh, but we'll get to Forge in a second. Before we do that, though, we talk more a little bit, a little bit more about York. Um, let's go back to York Live Stadium. And here are the thoughts of their boss. Here's Martin Nash. Yeah, you know, you, you see that out there. Um, uh, you know, a lot of guys that probably grew up playing against each other uh, from the GTA and uh, a lot of fantastic talent from this area all playing in the same field. So, uh, you know, looking for a bit of bragging rights every time they play. So they, they're, I've, I've seen, I watch all the games on TV, you know, being a coach in the league. So knew it was going to be a, a battle. Um, and it's, it's great to the effort the guys put in and uh, can't ask for any more from the players. Yeah, you can't ask anymore. You can tell that they're playing for him. There's no doubt about it. You, you alluded to Wilson came in the back. Roger Thompson, a little niggle, was given a bit of a rest. Um, you know, Johnston came back defensively a little bit more. And what I, the reason why I bring that up is because no matter what is asked of these players right now, Johnston is a 10, no, let's move you midfield. Wilson is midfield, no, let's move you to the back. Lowell Wright is a 9, no, let's put you on the left. Let's put Reacher. No matter what is asked of each of these players, they're, they're buying in. They're buying in and they're committed. And they're not individuals anymore. It's a team. I think that is very, very clear. Um, you know, in fact, they were asked, you know, Jordan Wilson was asked about this, you know, in terms of their history with Forge last, last season and how that has impacted the going into this game. Uh, here are the thoughts of one of the star performers on Friday night. Here's Jordan Wilson. Yeah, it was just a great game. Um, a wounded deer leaps the highest, I'm going to say. We knew that Roger was out. I think uh, he's been such a consistent leader in the back for us. Um, and just had a little injury this week. So, yeah, and we found out on Wednesday. So, Dom and I, we've been in a partnership for, for last year. But we just had to basically grind and get it done. If you could see our lineup as well today, we have a couple injuries. And, yeah, we just knew it was going to have to be a dogfight. So, I'm proud of the boys for, for stepping up and, and taking the challenge. And I think last year that would be a game that we tied. But today, we, you know, we rolled up our sleeves and we, we, got, the, we got the W. So, proud of the boys for that. Great quote as ever from Jordan. He alluded to no no Minitel, still no Max Ferrari with the, looks like a knee injury. And we'll see what happens with him coming back. Um, you know, Thompson was out at that moment. You know, there's you know, Hernandez is still suspended. Uh, so there's a lot of players still to come in and a lot of depth there, Charlie. But as someone who's covered this league from day one, uh, this is exciting times, no, for York United, a, a very different looking squad. 
Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I think one of the most interesting things that, that Jordan Wilson said there was that last year, this feels like a game they would have tied. And I think I agree with him in that sense, because there were games last year where, you know, they would have been happy to see through 70 minutes or so of a game and be like, okay, it doesn't feel like there's a lot in this for us. We'll, we'll sit back and we'll be happy with a point against a good team. But no, it, it seems like in every game this year, they are pushing for that late goal. They're, they've got that little bit more in the tank at the end of the game, which I think comes from being a more organized side who can conserve a little bit more energy towards the end of the game and try and feel out an opposition a little bit more and find the ways that they're going to hurt them. So I've been very impressed with York's just kind of stability and, and structure this year. And I'm very excited to see kind of how it continues to evolve. Because again, a lot of players still kind of need to hit the ground running here who have been struggling with injuries. You know, we, we obviously haven't seen the best of Max Ferrari. We all know what he can do. And there's a few other players on this team that, you know, we're very excited to see get integrated and get involved. So this, this is going to be quite an interesting stretch for this team as they kind of work that way up the ladder. And Mitchell, I was there with you as well. And, and Richie got about 40 minutes and you talked to Martin Nash after the game as well. And he alluded to the fact that he's probably ready to start very soon and with two games in a week coming up with Can Champ and then another game this weekend. You'd imagine that Richie's going to get a start in Nod and that's only going to boost their attacking threat as well. And, and, and you know, lots more depth to follow. Yeah, certainly. And I thought Ricci was a bit of a game changer for them offensively as well. I mean, moments before uh, that Gutierrez goal, he has a double chance that, that Henry saves well. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's uh, what you need is that attacking flexibility. And they've got Ricci in there. Like you said, Lowell right now is showing that he can play a bit wider. Uh, De Rosario had a, had a bit of a frustrating performance in terms of, you know, Forge definitely defended him well. But at the same time, you know, when the when the moments needed of him, he plays that perfect one too, and and there's your goal. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think this is a side that is is positioned well going into the Canadian Championship and the rest of the season in attack. Yeah, no doubt, Losandro Cabrera, Cabrera is back in now as well. He was there. Obviously, mm. that's important for them as well. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. But you know, the other thing I want to say is that, again, so many good players on this team right now. I think Dominic Zator has been the best defender in the Canadian Premier League so far this season. He was absolutely immense. And I know Wilson was terrific alongside him as well. There's that one area where Campbell got behind and Campbell scored the goal that obviously should have been a goal. But other mm -hmm. than that, I thought, you know, for them to stop an attacking team with like Forge and put them down to very little, the way that he leads that back line, I talked to Martin Nash about it after the game. You know, so many teams get deeper and deeper and deeper against Forge and they pick you off mm -hmm. because you can't get out. And Zator mm -hmm. and Wilson, I thought, were both very good with their feet. They kept in high. Zator's been absolutely fantastic so far. Here are the thoughts after the game of Bobby Sminiotis, uh, the head coach of Forge. Yeah, it was an interesting match all around, I think. Uh... You know, we've been off for, for a couple of weeks now. Um, we started off great. Uh, right at the beginning of the game, we've scored a goal. Uh, I think if we've seen it uh, in a replay, which I have, it's a goal. Uh, that changes games right off the bat. And uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that those things occur in, in games like that because I think that changes the way things are, are played and, and go. And, uh, you know, we need to see uh, that being a little bit better. Other than that, I think we've done a lot of good things in the match. Uh, we weren't under danger for most spells of the match. Uh, we controlled the match. Uh, we created a lot of good scenarios. We just couldn't get that uh, last punch into uh, into the back of the net in that final uh, third of the field. You know, as the game went on, York sat a little bit uh, deeper. And then they've had, you know, one or two chances, two chances in the second half, and they've made good on one. And, you know, then the game kind of changes, uh, needs to open up in that last 15 minutes and starts becoming a little bit more entertaining with counterattacks happening on both sides of the field. Um, we've played good football and we haven't come up with a result. Sometimes uh, that's how it goes. Uh, but things that happened, uh, like what happened in the first few minutes of the game, you know, that needs to be taken care of. A reminder, every analysis piece, every match report, sights and sounds, all can be read on campl.ca. More from Bobby Smeniotis on there, and of course on our YouTube page. Uh, and all, obviously, all highlights and analysis can also be shared on our YouTube, uh, courtesy of One Soccer. Uh, Mitchell, in your analysis of Friday night, you wrote, whenever they won possession, they being forged, they look to play the ball vertically with Borges, Becker, Schwenyar, and Campbell all making runs in behind at various moments. Whether those balls were in the air or on the ground, it was clear the directive was to test the York back line as much as possible. In fact, they had 154 passes into the final third over the course of 90 minutes, end quote. 
However, you alluded to earlier, their expected goals are still very low. We could go more into their stats. In fact, Forge had 62% possessions, as I said earlier, just four shots in the box, 20 touches in the box. They're lacking a little bit of rhythm right now. Your overall thoughts on the on the visitors on Friday? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think like I said, there was definitely a definitely a very direct attack from them. That was that was the directive was once they got the ball back, they were going forward with it. But I do think part of that was because they had difficulty getting through York's midfield. Like York played a very resilient midfield game where um, it was just tough to get the ball through that part of the field. So they almost had to bypass that sometimes. And then when you're getting the ball up there, there wasn't always the the attacking options um, that that they would have wanted. And I think that's just one example of how York was able to to get Forge off that game. And obviously it's it's very difficult when a minute or so into the game, you ha- have a goal that probably should have stood called off and, and what that does to your team mentally. But we've seen this Forge side recover from things like that before. And I don't think they really did in this game. They... They, you know, you were at field level, Christian. There was yeah. plenty of talking from from all of the players involved, and I think that benefited York a lot more than it did Forge because they just didn't seem to be on their their game. Yeah, they definitely lack rhythm, as I said earlier. Sorry, Charlie, one second. I think I don't think speaking to some of them, I don't think the game being postponed the week before helped them. They want mm-hmm. to keep playing. You know, they came off a season last year where they played every three games, literally almost every three games. I think forty games in one hundred and sixty two days. And now they're just at that long period off. And I think they like to have the flow of games. Here we are. The season's five weeks in. They've only played four. They've only won one game, Charlie. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. but how it, having said that, you know, this is still Forge. And we look at that jersey and we look at that badge and the number two on the side as two-time champions. But we have to say, Sissoko's new to the team. Poku's playing left back is new. Matusla's only in his second season. Hajabrapur's new to the system. So is Campbell. What's Borges' best position? We don't know, right? The, the best defender in the Canadian Premier League, Daniel krutzen has been out, and he's going to be out for a while. And I saw him on Friday night. He's, he's still a couple of months away, I think. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that are there, question marks at the moment. Like, do we think they're going to be in the playoffs at the end and maybe lifting the trophy? Of course we do. How can you ever write this team off, Charlie? But there are some questions right now that people are looking for answers. Yeah, oh, 100%. I mean, you say, you say this is still Forge, but... I would say it's not quite yet at the moment, the, the forge that we know. I mean, certainly, I, I know, as, as Alan mentioned there in the comments, a, a forge team without Daniel Kurtzen is a very, very different team. And I think we we can all agree on that. Bobby Smirniotis would agree on that completely because they don't have a center back like him who can play out of the back like that. It, like that. And that forces them to try and either force their way through the York midfield or try and play direct up the wings or something like that. And it obviously in this game especially didn't quite work for them. And so that that's a completely different element to to that team that, you know, maybe isn't something that they're as good at as they would be if they were able to build up a little bit slower with that better range of passing from the back. Because, you know, Dom Samuel and Garvin Matusala are excellent defenders, especially one on one, but they don't have the ability on the ball or the range of passing that Kurtzen does. And then Alex Alex Akinio Jansen can play in the center back in that kind of middle of a back three. But he doesn't really want to do that. He wants to be in midfield with that, you know, that other range of passing that he has, who's again a very important player for this team. So there are, you know, challenges for Forge that they haven't really had to deal with in in a little while. And and it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of respond to this and sort of try new things, maybe try and find a way to get some of these attacking players a little bit more of the ball, get them clicking a little bit more in those half spaces in the final third, because I think that's where those players like Tristan Borges and David Schwanier are best. So I I'm not. I wouldn't. I'm not worried about Forge. I don't think any of us really are. <laughs> they'll they'll be very good <laughs> eventually. But uh, there's certainly a lot of things that they're trying to to work along at this point of the season. Yeah, I think once it, it you know a different defense will look very different with Grant, Crutzen, and Morgan. Yeah. You know, I think it'll look very very different. Mm-hmm. I just think once everyone's back, what is Tristan Borges's best position? You know, what is it? Because right now he's playing a little bit out wide and, the, you know, they've got the direct of the right and the left. He's cutting into the half spaces. Or is he better as a 10 like we saw last year? And that's how they dominated Montreal in the Canadian Championship and they went with a base of a two. You know, you know, can they play a jab rapport and, and Becker and Janssen at the back maybe? I don't know. There's lots of different ways you can look at this. But um, fascinating. Um, and York are in it, just like Ottawa are in it. And we've got a real race here for this four uh, right now. It's going to be fascinating. As I said, Ottawa are definitely in it. Um, but they did lose 
lose on the weekend and another brilliant game. And Mitchell will keep you around because I know you're on this one as well. Um, Ottawa, Athletic Ottawa nil, Pacific one uh, on Saturday. A goal obviously decided in the end by Alejandro Diaz in the 72nd minute. Uh, but this was Callum Irving's game. This was Callum Irving's day, and this was a game Atletico Ottawa, quite frankly, had a lot of attack, particularly as the second half went on. In fact, the stats told the story in this one. They don't always tell the story. Uh, but 23 shots to eight, 11 shots to two in the box, 17 shots in the box alone uh, for Ottawa, 11 on target. And uh, Balu Tadla had a day. But in the end, it was Callum Irving. It was magnificent in net that stopped them. Um, Ottawa... <laughs> I think they were excellent, particularly in midfield. Ali Bassett had another terrific day as well. Balu played a different role in this one, Mitchell. Uh, but in the end, it was Manny Aparicio again, who's a very early candidate for player of the year, in my opinion. He's been marvellous. Who eventually was able to break it down with a shot outside the box that obviously came off back off the post. Nate Ingham couldn't really do anything about it. And then in the end, uh, Johnny on the spot himself, Alejandro Diaz. There you go with his fourth goal of the year. And Ottawa probably didn't get what they deserve and the champs found a way to win just like champions do Mitchell yeah absolutely I mean like you mentioned it was Callum Irving's day and Callum Irving stopped it from being Balu Tabla's day because Ottawa were the side that for the vast majority I think especially at the start and and after this goal as well um they very quickly responded with with a number of chances and um, as Pacific, I don't know if they switched off, but certainly Ottawa looked very hungry to to get at least something out of this game. But yeah, I mean, this was honestly probably the, the closest we've seen to Atletico Ottawa's identity. They're trying to build the uh, complete, like they were great defensively. Pacific, um, you look at the expected goals, they're close, but a lot of that is a Gianni De Santos chance at the end um, where he breaks in alone once the game's almost over. Otherwise, Pacific, only really created the one opportunity, um, like clear opportunity during the match, and it was all Ottawa on the counter attack. So I think that uh, there's a lot of positives to come out of this game for Ottawa, even if obviously there's no points for them. Yeah, Ottawa's definitely a, a team that's again trying to trying to build its identity. And Mitch, as you mentioned, this is probably the best example so far of what they want that identity to be with that very solid defensive structure. You know the the same double pivot in midfield with Ollie Bassett and Ben McKendry, which has been really good to start the season. And then they hit on the counter. And this is, I think, definitely the best we've seen from Balu Tabla and the reason that they signed him to be that player who can can run at defenses and stretch the pitch and hit on the counter. Um, and he's just one of those players that you have to have an eye on, like no matter where he is on the pitch, he will drift up there. He'll look for a ball over the top to, to him in space and he will hurt you. Uh, but it, it's just interesting to see how Ottawa can kind of they they can they can still you know sit back and defend well, but then when they want to, they can get up the pitch so quickly and they can create these chances. And I think maybe the last piece of the puzzle for them is to put the ball in the net, right? Because <laughs> there are a lot of a lot of these opportunities that I think they will want back. I think there's the one Malcolm Shaw chance where he's completely alone. He has to score that one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, overall, I I I think you guys would agree that they're probably very disappointed to lose that game, but probably pretty happy with the way they played against arguably the best team in the league. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think uh, you mentioned Tablo. Like, I think that tactical wrinkle was probably the the biggest difference was starting him up front next to Brian Wright. And it's a great partnership because Wright can kind of be that reference point for the attack and hold up the ball when they need to. And then Tablo is almost in a free role where he can drift into pockets of space all over the field. And if you're the opposing back line, you have no idea what to do with him because he can pop up anywhere and create a chance. So um, he's been excellent so far. And another thing that I've really liked from him is he's all action. I mean, he's going into duels all over the park. He's not um, you know, he's not just waiting up there for the chances to come to him. He's hunting for for possession himself. And um, for for a young player, obviously, with with his pedigree coming into this league, you, you're not sure exactly um, attitude wise what he's going to bring. But his attitude looks like it's been perfect. And um, I think this is a position that really suits him very well and is going to make Ottawa that much more dangerous going forward. He looks like he's having fun. That's mm -hmm. the first of all. He looks like he's really, really enjoying himself. And we know Balu likes to be active around the ball. Um, I know he's played a little bit and been asked to play a little bit more of a hybrid wing back, winger defensive role so far this season. That's not necessarily suited him. Um, and we know Carlos Gonzalez tactically is going to come up with something special and something different all the time. And he's done that. So I'm with you. I think it's a really good partnership. Um, in fact, let's go back to that game. And here is the thoughts of Balu Tabla after this one. 
I'm happy to be at that position because I'm close to to the opposite net <laughs> uh, to to have more ch um, chances to score and uh, to I like to receive uh, from the back uh, and turn in, uh, on my defender and uh, well, and dribble and help the team. So play right back. It's, it was a bit. It was a challenge and I accepted and I've been working uh, the few the few last two weeks so we saw that it's it's a bit tough to, to take the line and uh, make some run and come back again and that's why we we, uh, we spoke me and the coach and he tried he tried me uh, um, on front and since I'm, I'm there I'm, I'm feeling comfortable. Well, if he's comfortable, keep playing him there because he's, as you can say, he's really enjoying it. Just a couple more minutes left on this game before we get to the next one. Um, let's go back to uh, TD Plays in the nation's capital and here's the thoughts of Pacific FC boss James Merriman. First thoughts was uh, happy that we finished uh, with a win and got the result. Um, we came under a lot of pressure, you know, credit to them. They, they put us a lot, a lot of pressure the last 10, 15 minutes of the match. Um, our goalkeeper, Callum Irving, was excellent. Some uh, very important saves, obviously, big saves. So I'm happy for him to get the clean sheet. He more than earned it and deserved it. Um, excellent performance from him to keep us uh, and, and finish the game with 1-0. Quick thought on them, Charlie. 13 points from six. They return home now. I think they've got three games at home again now. Edmonton, York and Valor are... Uh, this is a team that's streaking away with the lead right now, and it's going to be difficult with this fixture list to come up to think anything other than being at the top for some time here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. They're just proving kind of more than any other team to be the, the group that can get the wins, they can get the results out of games, even when things aren't going their way. And I think, Christian, I think you mentioned it right off the top of this game. Champions find a way to win games, even when it's not going their way. You know, you never want, necessarily as a coach to see your goalkeeper have to do that much work in a game but there's a reason you have a goalkeeper and there's a reason that you try to sign it the goalkeeper that you think is the best in the league uh because sometimes these games do happen sometimes this these matches come along and at the end of the day the the goalkeeper is one of 11 players on the field and he has a job to do just as much as everybody else um and this was his day to shine you know alejandro diaz continues to be that that clinical presence in front i, I think I, not to take anything away from him, I I don't know how uh how much easier Manny Aparicio could have made that for him with the strike <laughs> off the post. But even still, you know this is a Pacific team that can be so lethal if you just give them the one chance that they need to put it in the net. They can beat you like that, and that's the end of it. You know that's kind of how they won the championship last year, right? <laughs> in that game against Forge, they just, it's the one chance that they need. And other than that, they weather the storm. So. Yeah, Pacific are definitely, I think, kind of coming clear as the front runners in this league at the moment, right? Yeah, J James Merriman, Manager of the Month for April, Marco Bustos, Player of the Month for April, and a good chance Callum Irvin could be Player of the Week. We'll see when the votes come in, but uh, let's go back to Ottawa. And, of course, Callum used to play in Ottawa. That was a pretty special place for him as well. Here are the thoughts of the Pacific number one, Callum Irving, after this match. Uh, this is a place that I enjoyed playing for three years. Um, enjoyed playing in front of the fans for three years and still have a lot of friends here. So I was looking forward to this game um, a lot uh, when I saw the schedule come out. And obviously for me as a goalkeeper, the ultimate thing is keeping a clean sheet and uh, getting the three points. And so for me, I thought our team battled really hard today. Um, we fought for it. it did, Ottawa didn't make it easy on us, especially after we scored. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's a place I love coming and I'm all the more happy that I'm able to win here too. Yeah, great three points, a great performance. Uh, Mitchell, great job, my man. Thanks for doing that. Uh, great work this weekend. And uh, a reminder, read all of Mitchell Tinney's work at campl.ca, including a fantastic tactical breakdown on Zachary Fernandez last week as well, all up on campl.ca. Uh, thank you, Mitchell. Uh, we move on to our next game now. And before we bring in Alex, let's roll the highlights of this game because this was Friday night's second game of the doubleheader as FC Edmonton nil, Cavalry FC 3. And Charlie, another Al Clasico that went the way of the red side of Alberta and not the blue one here. And again, for the third time this season already, goals were included from both Joe Mason and Ali Moosey in this one. Yeah, 
Yeah, as they as they tend to be with this team. You know, this is this Joe Mason goal, it's obviously on the screen now. That's a phenomenal piece of build up play from Cavalry, who just find those exact spots to make one touch passes straight to the middle. And then I think it's like ten a ten second play or probably even less than that. That's a four passes it's in the back of the net. Because they can just be such a dangerous side when you give them that inch of space and you give them that one opportunity to go forward through you. And then they I mean I didn't. I didn't personally know Ali Musi could hit a free kick like that, but it's a a very special, very special strike from him. But you know, aside from that goal, he had a phenomenal game, just driving at the Edmonton back line. You know, playing into into those kind of half spaces with the ball, trying to suck in defenders and then play it off for an attacker like like a Joe Mason or or somebody like that. Uh, Cavalry have shown here to be. That, that really, really aggressive direct team who will just run the ball forward and they will get at you and they'll they'll make you kind of run backwards on your heels because they can just kind of cut through defenses like that. And it's really, really entertaining, certainly from a neutral's perspective, but also very effective, especially against a team that's willing to kind of sit back like Edmonton or Cavalry really don't give you time to set up because they'll just push right through you immediately. Yeah, very, very impressive. Second consecutive week where they play from a back four and second consecutive week they get a three points. So that might be there to stay. And look at Cavalry's bench, by the way. Uh, very, very strong. Uh, here are the thoughts of their boss, Tommy Wilden Jr. after this. one. We're starting to click. I mean, if you look at the way um, our attack is now, when you've got players like Ali Moussi, Jose Escalante, um, Joe Mason, John Agnell, they're exciting going forward and as exciting a front line as, as I think we've ever had. And I still think they can be better. And behind that now, you've uh, Elliot Simmons has come back in the side and he kind of gives us that little, you know, insurance as the, as the base of our midfield and protection in front of our back four who are doing a terrific job in front of Marco. Some statement, by the way, when you think about the attacking threats that they've had over the years, and you think that might be the best they've ever had. Let's bring in Alex Venge Ruzik, who is obviously our correspondent on this one. Alex, great to see you, my man. Uh, I know you're at lots of games again, forever traveling. We'll get to, I want to ask you about the Whitecaps shortly as well, because they're big on this week in Canadian Championship. Before we do that, though, uh, you, you were watching this one very closely for us. Your thoughts on Cavalry's attack, because Escalante was terrific as well, and this one, as Tommy alluded to. And uh, do you agree with Tommy that they are starting to click and become very dangerous? Yeah, I think it was fascinating to see some of the the interplay they were putting together. For me, looking at, at the game specifically, you kind of talked about the back four. Uh, that was a huge change because uh, instead of the kind of usual 3-4-3 three, three that, that Tommy Wilden Jr. so famously you know, made a cavalry cornerstone, in this back four, we saw a midfield trio. And I think for me, that was really the key behind everything. That Ali Moussi, Victor Latoury, uh, Elliot Simmons. It felt like every time they were on the ball, it was kind of driving things forward because having watched a couple Edmonton games now especially at home when they're they're typically more solid they're better they, they've been really tough to break down in midfield I mean we saw it like a week prior when Pacific came to, to Edmonton and they were struggling to to break down that low block at times yet Cavalry they took that midfield trio they broke things apart and that really allowed space for Escalante for Joe Mason you know that, and when you get those guys running in transition, that that's dangerous. That's what they they like, and I think but through that, Cavalry really found maybe a potential way to break down this Edmonton team. And it was just like Charlie mentioned uh, when watching back the goal from earlier. It was so quick. It would be like they'd be playing it around the back. It would just be Yao, Trafford kind of bouncing between the two, and then the ball would hit Latoury, and it was like they had a switch. They would just completely get into position. They'd start activating their triangles. It would be one touch, two touch. Fraser Aird getting involved as well uh, on the on the first goal. Everyone was just would tuck in and find their roles, and it was so efficient and, and, and quick to watch. And I think if Cavalry keeps doing that, it's going to be very hard to defend because it's organized, it's fast, it, it's really hard to defend. Yeah, Fraser Aird very involved, as you mentioned, as he you know always loves to be cutting in from that sort of right fullback position. But I think. Something that sticks out to me is one of the reasons Cavalry were able to play with this kind of formation with the back forward, three men in midfield, is the debut of, of Bradley Vliet on the left side, right, at fullback. A, a traditional left fullback, which is something that they haven't had to start the season, you know, with, a, with the unfortunate injury to Tom Field. Um, you know, Alex, you were obviously watching the game super closely. Just what did you make of, of that debut and how do you think that that kind of changes the dynamic for Cavalry, who are able to now play with with a, a more kind of traditional back four in that sense. I thought he handled himself relatively well. I mean, he picked up a booking very early in the game, which is never ideal for, for a fullback. But I think despite that, 
Um, I, I will be curious to see maybe how he, he goes up against a team with more of a natural wide threat, just because with FC Edmonton, the way they they play, it tends to go through to, Tobias Warshewski in the middle. Uh, sometimes T-Boy Faya did get up the, the line, but for the most part, you know, late handled him very, you know, well considering the the yellow card so i think there's a lot of promise to to gauge from this game uh, but at the same time i would like to see him matched up against uh, more of a proper winger uh, based from what i saw there's 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 things to like and i think he'll he'll handle himself well but uh i guess we'll say encouraging for now we'll we'll like to see more yeah interesting I, I, again more depth right uh, you know you, we mentioned elliot simmons always been a big favorite of mine um you know he just comes in the, you know no no charlie trafford you know they've, they've got they've got out of they can play there you know, they've got Latori that can play there. Moose is suddenly playing centrally, which I think is really fascinating. I mentioned earlier, Klomp, um, who did have surgery in the offseason, for those who don't know, has come back and it's not quite at the level yet that he was. He's on the bench as it isn't playing every game. Norman Jr. didn't get to, you know, there's so much depth there for this team. Um, and they're a scary proposition now. You know, some would say they should have won at Forge if it wasn't for this one year screamer at the end. Um, they didn't win at all in their first three away games, but they've won back to back now. And Cavalry certainly look back themselves. Uh, as, as for FC Edmonton, um, things are looking a little bit, a little bit more bleaker than they were at the beginning. Uh, not gone their way this time after conceding two early first half goals for the first time at home this season. Here are the thoughts of their boss after this one. Here's Alan Koch. Cavalry deserves to win the game. Uh, I think they, uh, over the course of the 90 minutes, were the, the better team. Uh, I think they came out with more intensity than we came out with. Uh, and in a derby, as young as we are, uh, you have to come out with that intensity. You have to be ready to play from the first minute until the last minute. And I was pleased with our response in the second half. We challenged the guys a little bit at a half time. We got a positive response, uh, but that obviously doesn't impact uh, the results tonight. Three draws and three losses to start their season off so far through, uh, obviously, six games. Their schedule has been a bit more tighter than others. Um, you know, Cavalry in the league, in the, in the, in the Canadian, in the Canadian Cup in midweek, then a trip to Pacific away. So a difficult week for them. Uh, overall, uh, AGR, what were your thoughts, my man, on FC Edmonton, who obviously created a very big mountain to climb early in the first half? Yeah, I think that early goal kind of sunk them because... As you kind of saw, uh, you know, Alan Koch kind of talked about it uh, leading up. They were a bit of a tired team. The tired legs were there. And I think when you come into a match like this, obviously Cavalry sensed that. And based on how strong they came out on the road, obviously they thought they could uh, maybe crack Edmonton down. And I think they were ultimately uh, proven right. And I think Alan Koch also spoke about it after the game. He talked about how, you know, that was just the learning lessons that you kind of get in, in a moment like this where things might not be going to get, you know, in your favor. You're, you're going to have some tired legs, some, some injuries, guys coming back. You go down a goal and that's kind of the adversity you have to, to face. And I think what we're, we're seeing from this Edmonton team, they have shown some good things in, in the face of adversity. I like to think that that master catch air goal a few weeks back when they were down one nothing. Of course, that Warshuski bicycle kick also when they were down one nothing. But, uh, you know, that's the beginning of the season. That's when you're fresh. Now they're kind of learning, uh, you know, when things are starting to get tough. You, you kind of got this target uh, on you. You know, teams aren't going to you know want to go to Edmonton and, and be the team that, that loses to Edmonton. They want to be the team that goes out and wins. And I think Koch has kind of recognized that. Now it's up to his players to be like, OK, we're, we're these underdogs. We're scrappy. And when things are going to not go in our way, we're going to have to really lean into that and not let these moments break them. Because, yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, and on another day, you, 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 you take that Joe Mason goal, you go the other way. But uh, unfortunately, it just kind of got to them. But I think what's going to be good from Koch's perspective is that you play Cavalry again in a few days time Canadian championship, kind of a bonus game for, for Edmonton. I'd have to imagine in their minds, maybe this will be a good way to kind of exact revenge and show that they're not going to lie down and, uh, you know, have something like that happen to them. That, that's a great point. Sorry, Ty, that's a great yeah. point because we talk about cup sets, right? If FC Edmonton beat Calvary, that's a cup set. They've never beaten them. That's a massive cup upset in, in their mind. So they'll go there. They'll play the underdog card. It's one game. Take them to penalties. Try and beat them in 90 minutes. And FC Edmonton played really well last season at Calgary. There was one game uh, they played well. And Calgary scored very late in the game, I think. Or they tied 1-1. And it was a game where FC Edmonton should have won that game. Charlie, I mean, you remember we, we broke that down. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a game that they can really look on and say, okay, we can take something from that. So uh, it's a great point. Uh, before I let you go, Alex, we do want to ask you about the Whitecaps. They're playing this week on Wednesday night at BC Place against Valor of the Canadian Premier League. You know, the Canadian Championship game. We're going to get to Valor with Benedict very shortly in a couple of minutes. Uh, but overall, you were there yesterday. They narrowly beat TFC. We won't talk about the controversial decision, but what are your, where are the Whitecaps at right now in terms of 
you're seeing, you're looking at them as a form team coming into this Canadian Championships. Um, I think if for the Whitecaps, they can be certainly more optimistic than they were a week ago. I think they welcome back. Obviously, welcoming back Ryan Gold was was massive. He's so integral to to how they play, and I think we saw that yesterday. Just when he was on the ball, it, it offered so much quality. And I think uh, for the Whitecaps, uh, there there's there's some positives. I think they switched to a back four for the first time in almost you know eight months, and they looked a lot more solid defensively. Uh, you know. Still some very, you know, areas of concern, I'd say. You look at the midfield for them. It was against a TFC team that had one natural central midfielder uh, in their starting 11. And for most of the day, the Whitecaps still struggled in midfield, which is a huge worry. And I think an area where Valor can target. But I think you look at the Whitecaps attack. They showed some good growth there with the return of Gold. I think Lucas Cavallini to St. Ricketts off the bench showing good things, given their status as Canadians and this being a Canadian championship game. Maybe they're... They both feature to, to, to kind of obviously get the quota, but also just to, to, you know, for them, it might mean a bit more to, to be out on the field in a game like this. So I think there's a lot to be encouraged about with the attack and the depth, the fact that the Whitecaps kind of won the game uh, with guys coming off the bench versus starters. That's something that Vanny Sartini uh, talked about, uh, you know, being an important part of this team, the fact that they can consistently bring guys in. So for them, I'd say it's a bit more optimistic. There is worries in the midfield. Um, there is worries that, you know, obviously the form this year hasn't been ideal, especially in the Canadian Championship in past years. So maybe there could be some things in terms of how fragile they are right now. But I think they ultimately took this win. They know, you know, maybe they, they got a bit fortunate. I mean, Vanny Sartini jokes saying that maybe, you know, some people were in his corner yesterday. He wasn't going to complain about that. And they'll just want to take any sort of momentum into this game and uh, use the fact that they're at home that they maybe if they score first against Valor, just shut things down and, and avoid anything like against Calgary against Pacific where they're playing from behind and they just never recovered. A reminder that game, Vancouver Whitecaps versus Valor is Wednesday this week, all games live on one soccer. You can watch that on live on one soccer, 10 o'clock Eastern, seven o'clock Pacific. And our man, Alex, as ever, will be there for us on campfield.ca. Alex, thanks again, my man. Enjoy your week and we'll chat with you soon. Appreciate it there, AGR. Uh, he mentioned something there before we get Benedict in, Charlie. If the Whitecaps get a goal early, they'll settle on earth. But what if they don't? Because they are a team with the Canadian Championship memories only of last year of losing to Pacific. A lot of pressure on the Whitecaps, I think, in this game, right? Yeah. You know, you, you've, they, they still have yet to beat a CPL team. Ever. Because they lost to Calvary in 2019. That's right. Yeah. They lost to Pacific last year. Uh Bill Dos Santos definitely remembers that. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's a pretty fun narrative for him to be coming back to BC Place with Valor trying to, you know, do the thing to the Whitecaps that ultimately, you know, got got kind of cost him his job with the team last year. Right. Um, so it's yeah, yeah, uh Valor will definitely be the the loser team heading into this one because again, I I can't imagine what goes through the minds of some Whitecaps players if they really do start to struggle in the opening stages of that game. Bring it on. That's why we love oh, yeah. sports. But the mental edge of fascinating stuff. That'll be definitely a great storyline. There's enough storylines to write on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, let's bring in Benedict Rhodes, our man who had Valor on the weekend. Uh, Benedict, um, I apologize. I jinxed it myself. Last week I said, you get all the great games. Uh, <laughs> and then you get Valor nil, Halifax nil. Uh, it wasn't a stinker though. Uh, your overall thoughts on this one? Yeah, it was an interesting game. Uh, I think Halifax had, you know, as, as we see here, they had a lot of chances in the in the first half, especially they had, uh, I think, 12 shots to Valor's three, and, and they were just dominant in the first half. But a lot of their chances were coming from outside the box or, or from maybe low percentage sort of shots. And then the second half, it all changed, and, and it was all Valor after that. And the second half, and and, uh, and Phil DeSantos did say after the game he wasn't happy with the shot count, and he thought, you know, Anytime you need to rely on your goalkeeper like they sometimes they sometimes did with, with Jonathan Sirwa, who had an excellent game, by the way. Um, it is a bit worrying, but uh, you know, in the second half, it was a lot of a lot of chances from Valor and this couldn't make any of them count. And they couldn't make any of them count. By the way, Sirwa was tremendous. If it wasn't for Calum Irwin, uh, Irvin, uh, Jonathan Sirwa would be in the team of the week this week, but it's only one spot for a goalie, so we didn't get him in that in that spot. Uh, but you alluded to it. Obviously, Halifax very good in the first half. Uh, Valor came back into it in the second half. Andre Rampas said, I thought was tremendous. We're going to get a little bit more from him in, the, in, in that, in, in that, in, into him in a minute. Um, but Benedict, what do we make of Valor, a team that has struggled to score in some games? I certainly think of that Pacific game away where they really had nothing. They didn't have a lot going here. Um, yet they dismantled Ottawa for six. 
uh, and really probably had the better of Edmonton in that first game. They're only four games in. What do we make of their offensive attack here? And are they easy to nullify and just break down teams on a counter-attack like they do in Ottawa? And do they need a little bit more as a possession-based team? Yeah, I think um, the, the, the issue seems so far with Valor is if you nullify, you know, one of their big threats, then and then it kind of takes them out of the game and then, then it kind of nullifies all of them. Like I think we saw um, a couple of times with Moses Dyer was the guy that they were marking and and that forced William McKeel to do a lot of the work and and, and that worked against Ottawa. It said didn't, didn't against Pacific, but uh, for for this game it was Willie McKeel. Uh, Colin Gander, the Halifax left back, was fantastic in this game. He yeah. he was just just glued to Akio for the entire game and and uh, you know just took him out of the game. Really, he had, I think Akio had the lowest touches of anyone in this game who started the game and uh, just just brought him out of the game and 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 prevented him from from getting in behind and, and doing what he does best. Yeah, great. I thought Gander was excellent. Go ahead, Charlie. Sorry. No, no, I I. Didn't have much to add because I think it's a great point that Halifax did a really good job of just blocking off what Valor wanted to do. You know, obviously they love to play through William Accio on that right side. Gander does a great job at essentially pocketing him. Uh, he he has, still has a couple of solid chances in this game because he's just that good a player. Uh, but yeah, they, they really neutralized that threat. And then again, the midfield from Halifax was just able to really plug things up and force them to to go long or to go wide and to, to you know, go for those lower percentage chances. So you know, it's a it's a seventeen fifteen shot game, but you know, Valor is fifteen shots and point one eight expected goals. That's <laughs> that's kind of kind of absurd to me. It's on, it up. honestly shocking, but yeah, that really is the story of the day for them, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's it sums it up, no doubt. Talk, talk by the way, Colin Gander, stick around a little, a little bit more Guelph, uh, former <laughs> Guelph Griffin, more more Guelph content coming up very soon. Uh, um, before we get back onto that, and then I want to ask uh, Benedict a little bit more about a specific Halifax player who had a very special day. Here are the thoughts after this one of Halifax Wanderers boss Stephen Hart. Hmm. I thought we uh, we had a very good first half. Uh, we controlled the game. Uh, we recovered the ball in good areas, and um, just you know just wasn't happy with the with not being able to to take the chances. Um, in the second half, again, we, we created some chances, some big saves. Uh, I thought Valor's goalkeeper was excellent. Um, but also, you know, when a, when a goalkeeper starts making saves, somebody decides to pass the ball rather than finish it. And we started to lose a bit of control. Vala started to come into the game really well in the second half. Um, we made some substitutions and, uh, uh, you know, usually those things can, can go wrong. Uh, but they, they helped us. They did very, very well. And we, we had a couple chances at the end uh, in terms of free kicks and stuff. But at the end of the day, um, we, we didn't get the result. Uh, we, we felt we should have had. He didn't get three points, but what he did get, again, is another phenomenal performance from his captain, Andre Rampasad. 75 appearances now for Halifax Wanderers. That's a special number already in a very young league in the Canadian Premier League. Um, I don't know what else we can say about this guy, Benedict. He's marvelous. He's almost in the Canadian Premier League team of the week or contending every single week, shuts it down. I don't want to put any more analysis in your words. I'd like to hear what you think about him. You've covered him a lot. Uh, your overall thoughts on Rampasad on Saturday and also as uh, just a stellar leader for this club. Yeah, like you said, he's been extremely consistent for those four years now, I guess, in the CPL, his fourth year. Uh, he's just He's so good on the ball. He he can pass like the best players in the CPL. He can he can win the ball back and instantly just turn around and, and play a pass and, and and break off the counter attack and and that's so important for how how Halifax want to play and as well playing in midfield with Jeremy Gagnon and Lapare. Those two have played every single second of the season so far. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know when those two are in form, Halifax are, are going to have the best midfield in, in the CPL, I think. And and they've shown it so far this season. And and Riverside is their leader, is the captain, and. Uh, on on the ball and, and off the pitch as well, of course. Yeah, v- Vala didn't get the win, uh, but what they did get was they got a point down to their star goalkeeper. They didn't need Siwa when they're scoring six in Ottawa, but they certainly needed him on the weekend. Uh, here are the thoughts of the CF Montreal loney goalkeeper, Jonathan Siwa. Uh, different from, from the other games, that's for sure. Uh, I think the first uh, three games, uh, maybe except Pacific, but that's a special occasion where we're one man down. But today I was tested a lot, I feel like, and... Uh, Feels kind of good to you know get a, a good performance in. 
That's the thoughts of the reigning goalkeeper of the year in the Canadian Premier League. And by the way, Sirwa, in the terms of his loan agreement, will not be eligible to play uh, in midweek in the long game, in the game against Vancouver Whitecaps uh, in the Canadian Championship. Uh, but Bennett, before we let you go, what impressed you the most about Siwa? As I said, if it wasn't for Callum Irvin, he'd be a shoe in for the team of the week. He's such a good shot stopper, especially. I mean, that's obviously his main point of his, his job, of course. But uh, you know, he's just so good with his hands and. And uh, we saw a couple of times on Pierre Lamoth at the start of the second half, he made a couple of big saves. Uh, he did have one moment towards the end of the game where he tried to come out of the out of the box and and head the ball away and, and completely whiffed on it, um, which he said was a mistake. But um, yeah, he, he's he's played sort of a sweeper keeper role as well last couple of games, and he's he's been very good and and uh, taking advantage of his opportunities again and and again proving why he's one of the best goalkeepers in the CPL. Fantastic stuff. Yeah, see what was tremendous. And a great and great job, Ben. Yeah, sorry again for jinxing you and giving you a nil-nil, but I promise the next game you're going to have, and I promise it's an absolute slam dunk assurance, the next game you work on is going to have a goal uh, for you to write about because you're doing a Canadian Championship Cup game this weekend. We're going to get yeah. something. So uh, there you go. I guarantee you. Uh, Benedict, thanks again. We'll chat with you next week. Appreciate the time. Benedict Rhodes, all of his work and action, of course, at CampPL. .ca. Uh, before we turn the page, Charlie, and look ahead to a very exciting week, uh, let's take a look at the standing so far in the Canadian Premier League. And as you can see, uh, pretty, uh, I mean, they're a little bit all over the place. You don't look at standings too early in the season. Uh, but the one name that stands out for me, York United, second right there, eight, eight points through five games. Obviously, some other people are making up games down the bottom there with Valor and Forge. But obviously, in the end, uh, this is a pretty surprising table with York at the, in the top two, Charlie. It's going well for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you still need a lot more games to start deciding who's for real and who isn't. I but agree. I, other than Pacific, I think I think we can all agree that they're probably for real and going to make the playoffs. But uh, yeah, uh, definitely an excellent, I think, start for York United so far. They've been arguably better every concessive game they've played. Uh, so definitely a deserved second at the moment. They certainly are. Uh, without further ado, let's turn the page to the Canadian Championship and bring in our special guest, and it's certainly a special guest. We're delighted to have Keith, Keith Mason, head coach of the Guelph United and in League One champions. Uh, Keith, great to have you on. Thanks for joining the show. An exciting week, no? Ahead for you against Halifax Wonders. How are you feeling? How's the club? Uh, we're feeling absolutely amazing. We're feeling excited. We're all those emotions are just uh, just all boiling up. It's been a, a tremendously busy couple of weeks preparing. I think uh, we're the first League One club who's actually hosted one of these games and trying to pull it at that scale. And, and it's been incredibly busy, but it'll be worth it tomorrow when uh, we see all those bombs in the seats. We've, you know, we've, we've spoken a lot in the Canadian Championship about what it means for the CPL teams to go and play the MLS teams. They play, you know, up a division. But for you guys, the League One teams, the PLSQ teams, what does this competition mean to your teams to be able to play against, again, test yourselves against a, a higher level, against, against a CPL team? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I think it's, for, it's great for Canadian soccer. Uh, I am a background back in England and a kid growing up in... Uh, England watching Hereford United beat Newcastle and uh, Woking beating my team West Brom and and which had, was it, what a disaster that was and uh, but the excitement of that cup competition where smaller communities get to test themselves get to bring football right in their own door and and for us we have a lot of ex CPL players and you know some of them may feel aggrieved they haven't been picked up some of them may feel. They want to get there and there is an opportunity for them now to perform on, on this stage again and, and show what they're made of. So so it's everything we uh, we could dream of. And, um, you know, it's it's probably uh, uh, year three, year four in our five year plan. And that's eight months into our business. So we've done pretty good. Keith, you are Mr. Guelph when it comes to soccer. Over 30 years there. What does Guelph mean to you and for those listening and watching? Tell us a little bit about the soccer community in Guelph. Well, Guelph is, is it's been my home now since the early 80s and I've been coaching here ever since then. And, and I, just, I just love the place. And we've always dreamed of bringing that next level to Guelph. That, that you know, it's been a, a soccer community that's been uh, never one of the biggest in terms of, of you know, the Oakvilles and, and Scarboroughs and all these teams, but it's always been a, 
a soccer community that's there, uh, like a family club. And uh, and and we've always wanted to bring a higher level uh, of, of competition to to the pyramid of play. And 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 finally, we've seen that come to play. So so to be able to do do this game right in our own backyard uh, is I can't explain how, how exciting that is. I mean. Again, it would have been a lot easier for us to go gone to Halifax. Uh, they would have loved to hosted us, and they wanted to host us. And, and you know, uh, uh, it would have been great. I love Halifax as a city and, and go to a CPL club and uh, a free ride out there and actually make some money for the club. But you know what? Doing things the easy way is not what it's about. It's about doing what's right for the community. And Guelph is a community that deserves to be on the stage for this short while. And I'm so excited we can do that. Speaking of Guelph and your club and your community, what would it mean to you guys to be that first League One team to beat a CPL club? I mean, others have come close, but what would it mean for you guys? <laughs> uh, how do I describe that? I mean, it's just out of that. It would be out of the world, right? To, to bring a, a potential of bringing Toronto FC into this community is, is something that uh, only dreams are made of. You know, I, there's lots of movies being made about those kind of storylines. And, and for us, it would definitely be a movie Hollywood script, I think. So that, that's how far-fetched it would be if you talked about it 12 months ago. Yet here we are on the verge of being able to play the biggest game of, of, of not only our lives, but the community of Guelph and surrounding area with the opportunity of playing an MLS team in the next round. I mean, it's, it's, it would be, it'd be incredible. It'd be fantastic. And uh, in terms of us being the first to win, someone's got to do it. One day, someone's going to open that door and go, we're the first team to get to that next round and win that prelim game. And, uh, and I just say, hey, what about us? Let us be that team. And tomorrow's the day. Bang that door wide open. Why not you, right? Toronto FC, as you mentioned, have been drawn away from home to play the winner of this tie. Uh, Keith, for those who haven't seen your team play live, what is the style? How would you describe your, your tactical identity of your club? Um, well, we're defi definitely much a possession-based team, you know, like uh, we like to keep the ball on the ground. We've recruited good good ball players who like to get on the ball, you know. Uh, uh, when you look at uh, uh, Jace Kosopoulos and Alex Zies and and Marcel Zajac, who we've picked up this year, like they all like to get on the ball and play, you know, and, and that's the kind of player I've always liked. That's it. That's what I was brought up with. And I, I love it. I love, I love the game to be played what I call the proper way, which is, you know, let's, let's build from the back and keep possession as long as we can. We know that's going to be difficult tomorrow against a team that's um, uh, above us and, and, hot favourites to win the match. So so we know it's going to be difficult, and but we've still got to be brave, try and get on the ball, keep that ball as much as we can when we do have it, and and, and give, us some, uh, give us some good moments. You mentioned some of the names there. For anybody who doesn't know, there's a lot of players on this Guelph roster that are familiar to CPL fans. So they've either played with the league or you know been drafted in the youth sports draft. Does it help you guys a little bit to have players that have a little experience with what the level is like and, and what to expect against a CPL team? Yes, hundred percent. It helps. They, uh, you know, part of my job is is reminding them of uh, as much as I have confidence in all my players. We also have to be realistic of where we are in the pegging order of of, of this uh, pyramid of play in Canada, and and you know, I have to remind them we we're the big underdogs, and and uh, and we know that, but. But having people like Tommy Skublak, who's who's not only played for Halifax, but he used to play for me at the university many years ago. Um, Jay Scott Sopolis, as, as you say, Marcel. And and we have people like uh, Marta Oakley, who played in Poland, uh, sorry, in uh, Portugal. And and many players who've come from that sort of uh, uh, professional level that, and, and have dropped down to us. So so we've got a good core who, who used to, to those games. Uh, the big question now is is we have to have them all on top of the game tomorrow and all Halifax a little bit off and then uh, and then see what we can do. 
We cannot wait. Keith, we cannot thank you enough for joining us. I know it's an unbelievable busy time for you personally and professionally as well. Uh, as John Herdman said, Canada is now a soccer country. And when we have cup ties like this, it certainly reminds us of the great FA Cup back home as well. So, Keith, all the best for tomorrow to you and your team. We'll see you in Guelph on Tuesday. OK, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, our pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the, the great Keith Mason, as I said, this is a man who's been in Ottawa coaching the Griffins for years, Charlie. Well, uh, years. They get, they, they get their chance in League One, um, you know, Guelph United. And in year one, that's right, year one, uh, they beat Oakville in the final and become champions and now get their chance. He alluded to it there. You know, this was their year four or five plan. And here they are getting it inside 12 months. Just remarkable, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love. I mean, I love the Canadian Championship a lot, but I especially am excited to see you know this this League One team hosting a CPL team, especially this kind of new edition of the of League One Ontario, where they've they've really started to kind of you know connect with these communities and, and these fan bases there. So, and and Guelph United's a good team; they've got a lot of good players on this roster that that I've been looking at. So I, I think it it is going to be quite a competitive game, and I'm excited for it. Yeah, I'm excited for it too. You know, this is what we want, right? We want you know we want. You know, opportunities to continue to see the game grow, no, no doubt about it. Uh, we should remind people we have five games this week in the Canadian Championship. Atletico Ottawa against York United, 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. I believe, don't quote me, but I believe, I think that game is on one soccer. Guelph United versus Halifax Wanderers, 7 o'clock at the same time. I believe, don't quote me, I think that game's on YouTube, available for everybody to watch uh, in that way. And then following that, Cavalry FC in another version of our classic, I'll take on FC Edmonds at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Mountain Time kickoff live on One Soccer at that point. And then, uh, and then on Wednesday, we have two more. We have the Griffins of Mount Royal going to Forge uh, to play that, the, the, them at 7 o'clock Eastern. And then the Whitecaps against Valor at 10 o'clock on on Wednesday at seven o'clock West, obviously in, on the local time as well. Uh, five teams to make sure they get to the final eight, Charlie. Uh, apart from Guelph, uh, what else is tickling your fancy here in, in, in five fantastic matches? Oh, there's there's a lot of them. I uh, you know I, I can't wait to see this Al Clasico rematch. I think yes, that's, as we as we alluded to earlier in the show. You know, I, I Cavalry trying to maintain that record against Edmonton. Edmonton trying to to knock them off, but. You know, I'm also excited to see Forge motivated to get that rematch with Montreal if they win their game against the PLSQ side, Montreal uh, So yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of fun. It, it, there's nothing better than a cup tie, right? Nothing no. better. So no, it's, it, it's, it's going to be fun. It's what we need in this country. It's what we've waited a long time for. Yeah. You know, um, storylines to come uh, again. We'll be all over it this week. Campl.ca. Uh, read all our previews, all our analysis, and of course. Uh, all our goals and stuff will be up on there as well on our YouTube page coming up this week. Um, this has been it. This has been week five in the Canadian Premier League. Week six will be soon with us next week. And we've got two more double headers for you. That's right. Next weekend, Forge take on Atletico Ottawa at four o'clock on Saturday at seven o'clock Eastern, four o'clock local Pacific take on FC Edmonton. And then double header on Sunday as the Wanderers grounds again, I'm sure will be packed to the rafters as they take on high flying Cavalry FC. What a fantastic game that will be. That is your come on match of the week. I'll be in the One Soccer Studios for that. And Vala take on York United in the doubleheader to wrap up all things match week six in the Canadian Premier League. Uh, this has been the Newsroom Show, and we'll leave you with the goals of the month for April. Enjoy, everybody. Di Rosario! Out of nothing for the guests! A nice interchange with Bustos, the header at the post, and in from Mini Aparicio! Here's Minitao! His third strike, he wasn't gonna waste! And burns his former side with a scorching finish! Working together go Di Rosario and Abzi. Saze Di Rosario, you know he wants to hit this, he does! And he scores again! Osaze Di Rosario! See which of the two will strike the free kick, it will be bent. He goes directly for goal and he has found the back of the net! Trying to pick 
that out. Calvary defense went to ground. Schwinn, yeah! First opportunity dealt with. My word, what a rocket from well outside the box. And he's scoring again at Tim Hortons Field. No need, no rush to move forward. It's a lot of lateral passing in Ottawa. You have to put the pressure on to try and break it up. Finally pass it, comes over. Now Rea back in front for Levi's. Advantage being played for Levi's. Nice move to the middle. Brett Levi's! What a hit! Now a long ball in the direction of Smith. Timoteo following up. Can he keep it in play? Yes, does. West Timoteo with the cross into the box. And what a goal! Toby Warshevsky has found the equalizer in stoppage time.